All right, everybody. Uh, broadcasting from down the well at Balticon and deep into space, it's time for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week, we bring you on an industry guest and uh, play a game with them. Uh, we're going to talk about the expanding ever. I, I f this up. We're going to talk about the ever expanding Gigaverse. Only read this like a thousand times. All right, and Doing play. Good. Doing good. <laughs> we'll do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my co-host, Mike Kafis. You never hold your no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh My other co-host, Bruce Press. You've lost that love. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> and our esteemed guest, Catherine Acero. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine Acero has written more than 20. I'm going to read this again. Has, more, more than tw- has written more than 25. She's read more than 25 books, too. Written more than 25 <laughs> books, <laughs> fiction, fantasy, and near future thrillers. She earned her doctorate in chemical physics and master's in physics, both at Harvard. Her work, uh, The Quantum, 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 oh my God, The Quantum Don't Rose. Do it. It's a long do it. day, man. And The Space Time Pool. Are both Nebula Award winners. Among her other distinctions, she's a multiple winner of the Ann Lab from Analog Magazine and the RT Book Club Award for Best Science Fiction Novel. Her most recent books are Undercity uh, with Bane and Lightning Strike Book Two. Her latest book, The Bronze Skies, came out from Bane in 2016. A former ballet and jazz dancer, uh, Catherine has performed on both coasts and in Ohio. As a musician, she for, she performs at various cons and jazz clubs. She has appeared at cons and other venues as guest of honor or or author guest in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, Bruce has spent 30 years as a computer engineer and regrets none of it, except for all the time he didn't spend as a photographer. He is a husband to one. She's right there. And a father to many. So it's Out there. Yours. Out there. All of you. <laughs> Uh, when he is not creating images or video, he is working to promote science critical thinking podcasts and the idea that everyone on this planet will be equally screwed if we don't all pull together. So welcome, Whoa. welcome, welcome. All right. So one of the things, uh, Mike and I were, were looking over the bio and, and Mike had a question and, and I, I ain't going to lie. I had a little bit of a question of it too. Uh, uh chemical physics. That's uh, tell me what chemical yeah. physics is. What are the key um, core classes in that? Yeah. Well, I had to show proficiency in chemistry, physics, and applied mathematics. Wow. Okay. Because I was right. a theoretician. Chemical physics is, for example, what I did was use quantum theory to investigate the behavior of atoms and molecules mm. in intercellular. Oh, space. so just simple stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a little yeah. stuff. <laughs> just a little bit hard. <laughs> we we earned our degree in. Uh, in um, yeah, Tom Foolery, shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we we interviewed somebody earlier this morning. We interviewed uh, Jim. Oh, Jim Bell. Uh, Jim Bell. And we earned our degree in um, nuclear. nuclear engineering because we found out all what takes to go into building a nuclear power plant. So, so we're good. Uh, nuclear. Nuclear. <laughs> nuclear. That's Thank part of the degree. Come on now, nuclear. So by the end of this, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to. <laughs> Degree us in this uh, quantum physics. Yeah. Quantum physics, yeah. Just a few minutes. And go. All right. So, <laughs> so I want to touch on. So, we, because there's all the all the sciencey stuff and the writing and stuff. I want to talk about. I, I want to hit real quick. I want to hit the ballet and jazz dancing in your music career real quick. Uh, tell us about okay, that. I was actually a dancer first before okay. I was. Yeah, people think there's this big disconnect between dancing and doing like theoretical physics, right? But it's actually not true. <laughs> yeah, they're just so, Everybody so laughs. like <laughs> no. And if you buy that, I have some property in Florida. You know? right. No, seriously. When you know there's a connection between math and music, most people are more aware of that. And a lot of mathematicians play an instrument. Well, dance is not that different. It's just that traditionally, especially because ballet is where the connections are strongest. Traditionally, girls tended to do ballet and boys tended to do math. Right now, we have more boys doing ballet and not being embarrassed by it, and more girls doing math and not being embarrassed to be, you know, in the group that they generally weren't uh, traditionally associated with. So it, now it's becoming clearer that not only do you have, I mean, music is very mathematical, like Bach has a very mathematical structure to the music. Well, dance has that, 
in it, but it also, you're incorporating it into your body. To learn choreography, you need to learn patterns, how to move in patterns in space. Okay, you need spatial perception. I'll give you an example of this. When I was teaching physics at Kenyon College in Ohio, that's why I was in Ohio. Right in Ohio, right? I was going to say, it's all these great places. They gave me a hard time. And Ohio. She's <laughs> danced in Los Angeles and New York and Hollywood and Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but I was teaching at Kenyon College. And I was also taking a ballet class with, you know, they had these big, huge classes that students could sign up for. So I was taking one. And one of my physics students was in the class. And she said to me, well, you know, I was, I don't know what to major in. I said, you should major in physics. You're really good at it. She said, no, I don't. There was this belief back then that women didn't have the spatial perception capabilities that guys had. And it was nuts. I knew it was nuts. So she says to me, I don't have enough spatial perception. I said, that's really <laughs> bogus. And she said, no, no, I don't believe I do. And I said, well, you're taking this class for grade, right? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, the ballet class. And I said, what for your dance final do you have to do? She said, well, I choreograph a dance. You know, she designs a dance. And I said, okay, how many people are in your dance? And she said, there's eight of them. And I said, what are you doing with them? She said, well, I have a piece of music, and I worked out, you know, the dance to the music, and then I'm teaching it to them. And I said, how long is the piece of music? She said, it's about five minutes. And I said, and how did you work it out? She says, well, I worked it out in my mind, and then I, you know, I give it to the dancers and see if they can do it. And I said, so let me get this straight. <laughs> you worked out for eight people all of the patterns and how spatially it's going to be set up right. in the room for five minutes of music in your head. And she said, well, yeah. I said, I wish most of our physics majors had that good <laughs> right, perception. Right, right. <laughs> so she just didn't didn't make the connection. So there's a lot of that. In yeah, dance. yeah. So that, you, but you decided uh, to stop doing uh, jazz and, and uh, doing dance and music, or uh, well, you still do music, well, right? Yeah, I actually still dance. I had a oh, solo did you? last year. Yeah, okay. A show, but um, there's only so many hours. Yeah, I know. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. You have to make decisions. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's why I don't do this for a living. <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> that's why. All right. So, <laughs> so Pete accuses me sometimes of being a little aloof and not being able to put things together from books and, and authors and their experiences. So I'm going to go on a limb here and say that in, um, you're like, your main character, Ruka, would probably be a dancer, and maybe that was some of that uh, yeah. may have had some. See, I told you. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Did you actually read the book, or did you just figure I, that no, out? No, I did. No, I read Skyfall. Oh, yeah. I, I was, it. And I was a little disappointed because it was the first one I read, and I thought, I, oh, I should have read a lot of other things earlier, but this is like a precursor, and that's why it's like one in chronology as opposed to... It's not huh. the best one to start with, though. You yeah, know? I, I, yeah. yeah. But I, guess what? Now I get to go into more. Yeah. <laughs> Skyfall's a little bit more... It's a little less... Emphasis on the hard SF and the space adventure, a little more on the relationship between mm -hmm. the two characters, which is nice. It's about the parents of the main characters and how they met. But yeah, she's a dancer, of course. Wait, so is this the is this the mother and father from yeah, the primary right. inversion? Yeah. For, okay, because I read primary inversion. It's about how Saw's his parents. Oh, how Saw's his parents. Okay, all right. So I know I can put, fill in those blanks for you. Oh, thank you. All right, good, good. So yeah, he lives on a very backwater planet. As, as you would call it. And, it's uh, called Skyfall. It's got, right? <laughs> and I swear, I did not know about the movie when I made oh, that up. Right, I made yeah. it up long before the movie came. And everyone was going, did you do that to sell more books? Because, you know, the James Bond movie, Skyfall. Mm. And I didn't. It was already in the works. But did it sell more books? It, I think it did help. <laughs> no, <that's good. laughs> Oops. James Bond in outer space. Shame right? on them. <laughs> right. Well, James there was a book when Primary Inversion came out. There was a book called Primary Colors that was, I think, oh, on yeah. the bestseller list then. And so I think, I think that got me some sales too. <laughs> All right, you hear that, Cooley? There's this is how you <laughs> sell some books, brother. So I just need to find somebody who's written a catchy title that could. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but see, when you get, when right. you settle on the title, it's a year, like a year, year and a half before, so you don't know. You, know. you need to know what you that book's going to be ahead of time. 
You know what you should do? Like, right. another advantage I have is my name was between Asimov and uh, who was on the other side? No, but that's a, another good one. It was, oh, in the A's. Asimov and Aunt Piers Anthony. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was always in between the two. This is back when people actually bought books, you know. Yeah, they actually went and out and stuff. saw shelves. And How yeah. to pick a pen name. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that helped, too, I think. Okay. All right, cool. So Mike read Skyfall. I read Primary and Version. And Bruce, what have you read? Um, I read the first two. Well, I read a couple a number of years ago, and I read the first two in um, I'm terrible at names, the series. You're, you're the Primary and Version. Major Bajan. Yeah, no, yeah. Primary and Version. Oh, okay. Yeah, first two. Okay, so one of the things I noticed that, that plays extremely heavy, and I guess you can't read one of your books without without noticing this, is the empaths, the, the roles of the empaths in society. Oh, yeah, and the, the Ruby Dynasty books. When I first started writing those, essentially they are people who have strong ability as empaths and maybe slightly telepaths, but it's enhanced by technology, especially for the military officers. And at the time when I did this, people were saying, oh, that's not hard SF. But I actually spent all night one time with a graduate student in um, neuroscience going through how, if you were, we're actually going to have people who are telepaths or marginally telepaths, what would you need in the brain? And we worked out the whole thing. And she, we even came up with names for the chemicals and the organs in the brain and how they worked and all this stuff. But also, it's enhanced by technology in that they have things that's implanted in the nodes in their spines and, and things that can, you know, pick up what's going on with their brain waves. Well, I went to APL, the Applied Physics Labs, uh, to give a talk a few months ago. And they're taking me around the lab. And my talk was on this futuristic, this, ugh, futuristic stuff. And they're taking me around the lab and they're showing me all these things that I'm about to talk about. And one of them was technology used to essentially play the part of telepathy in that this guy was thinking, they were showing how these machines had worked out how to recognize patterns and neural firings in the brain and recognize words from it so that it would be able to tell what you were thinking. And if you could take it a step farther, you could send signals so you could send a thought to it. And it was like, oh, so I don't have to give my talk, you know. You guys you, have you guys have already done it. But so in the period of time since I first wrote Primary Inversion, I wrote it probably about 19, early 1990s, and yep. it was published in, uh, it was 95. So I wrote the first version at the end of the 80s. Oh, wow, okay. So... In that time when it was a ridiculous thought, it's now something that's being worked on so, so much that I could just walk, you know, not walk, but drive down to a lab that's about a mile from my house and see an example of it in process. Yeah, it was really, I was impressed. Yeah, I was, I was really impressed with, you, uh, you give us a lot of information when you, like, she doesn't just oh, drop know. this on you. She doesn't just say, oh, they can do this. No, she goes into... Uh, like Some how people stuff works. thought I did a little too much. In Maybe, it might have been a little heavy. A little did bit you heavy. read the heart, the book or the Kindle? Uh, I, I well, I, I I'm going to confess, I'm an audio book guy. I listen to the audio. Oh, okay. So you got the real heavy tech heavy one. Oh, okay. The Kindle I rewrote it for the ebook version, and I kind of paired. I streamlined some of the the exposition. I love the tech exposition. That was one yeah. of my favorite parts. But well, I also thought it was interesting how you took that. Um, the empathic ability and made it fundamental to um, their sort of sociopolitical structure, yeah. right? With with the inability to communicate if they didn't have this high function to tell that to make things work. That that was int really interesting because you you put it at the core of what was going on. Well, it's part of that came from my doctoral work. I mean, the idea of these people using telepathy to communicate, you know, uh, was predated my doctorate, but. Do you guys mind if I get really neepy, math neepy? Go for it. <laughs> Do it. Okay, the idea in my, uh, the work that I did, my research for my PhD thesis, I did a lot with something called Hilbert spaces. And one of my books, I think it's Spherical Harmonic, even has a whole essay about it in the back of the book. 
And I love these things called Hilbert spaces. So think about this. Like your position where you're sitting, I could give your exact lo location by giving, you know, your high, your distance from the ceiling, your distance from that wall, and your distance from me. Three coordinates. So we live in a universe where our spatial position is determined by three coordinates. We say three dimensions. Well, Hilbert spaces, instead of an X, a Y, and a Z direction, you know, up, across, and back and forth, you have an infinite number of functions that determine your space. Like if you are you guys familiar with sines and cosines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like sine 2 theta, sine 3 theta, sine 4 theta. And each one is itself something that determines position. And it's infinite. You know, you can go up to infinity sine, sine infinity theta. And the idea is that just like we can specify any position in space by three coordinates, you can specify any mathematical function by, you know, these silver spaces. You just take the proper sum of them with coefficients determining how much each of those pieces contributes. So I thought, what if you could make a universe where things were determined by these infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces instead of position? And so I thought, well, maybe you could Fourier, Fourier transform is, I'm sorry, am I getting too mathematical here? No. <laughs> Oh, okay, Fourier transforms are a way that engineers use all the time to transfer from, say, energy space to time space, for example. A signal in time, how does it operate in time? I can transform that to a space that explains to me how it operates at different energies at a specific time or how it operates at different times for a specific energy. Well, I thought, what if I could do that with thought? This is, <laughs> this is how I kept myself entertained when I was getting burning out on my thesis. <laughs> uh, you know, suppose these people are telepaths. Well, in quantum mechanics, it is a fact that you can describe the, the, uh, your brain by a wave function. Okay, and that may sound ridiculous, it may not make sense, but it's actually true. People can, quantum mechanics is all about that particles act like waves. It's a model, you know, is it truth? that we can't really say for an electron, is it a wave or is it a, a particle with mass? It's not, oh hi. <laughs> it's not, um, it's not something we see on the level we live on. You know, people don't diffract when they go through the doorway. Right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> because the wavelengths are so tiny. Right. But, you can actually describe position of any particle, any collection of particle, including a human being, by, you know, a wave, a function. So we could, we don't have the computing power really to do it at this point to describe the wave function that describes your thoughts, but you can, it can be constructed. So when I was burning out on my thesis for fun, I would imagine what could I do with these wave functions? right? Especially if they're telepaths. And I said, well, let's transform from a space where you have one thought and coordinates can be anywhere. You know, my position can be here, there, any place while I'm thinking to a space where it's not dependent on the coordinates. It's dependent on the thoughts. So you two are close together spatially. And I don't know if you're close together in what you're thinking or not. You're listening to the same person, so you're all probably sort of adjacent to each other in your thoughts right now because you're listening to a, a conversation about a specific subject. Well, in this space, what determines position is what you're thinking, not where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. And so if someone 4,000 light years away from you is thinking the same thought, you'll be next to each other in this space. And because... It's a mathematical construct, so you can't go there. But I thought, well, you know, it would be fun supposing they can transform their thoughts. That's why I pick thoughts as opposed to something with matter in it, because it doesn't take energy to make your thoughts, you know, to, to define your thoughts. Well, I can tell you that this young lady was definitely trying to wrap her head around what you were saying. <laughs> Julie was thinking, did I leave the oven on? <laughs> so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry I'm getting into all this neat. But that's where it came from, that system. That's the idea because, oh, then it hit me. 
instantaneous communication across interstellar distances. It's the big thing we don't have in science fiction. Uh, Ted, I was thinking, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no more math me. <laughs> That's in honor of my math student who just yeah. came in. <laughs> really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and so they like, um, yeah, they like basically try to have the same dreams and like, like, they, like there's a name like, for that. Like, yeah, it's about lucid dreaming. Yeah, that, that's what. Yeah, yeah. 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 Lucid dreaming, like, but it's it's like a subset of lucid yeah. dreaming. That yeah, it's tandem. Like a lucid dreaming. <laughs> there you go. So yeah. there was a movie though, right? The Inception. Yeah. Oh, well, good. <laughs> that was Ince- Inception. No, no but before oh. The oh, oh, God. Um, Dreamscape. Yes, Dreamscape. Dreamscape. Doesn't hold up. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> so so those, those are the books that you did before. Currently, though, uh, you have, you have uh, Undercity with Bane and, and Lightning Strike, book two. Uh, well, Lightning Strikes Book 2 is actually not finished yet. Book okay. 1 is out. I thought Book 2 okay. would be out. Oh, okay. Now. That's why it's on the description. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> but it's not out yet. And then Bronze Guy. So you write, I'm, I was just, I'm looking at all these books here. So you write pretty prolifically? Do you have? Well, I used to write about three books a year. Okay. Then when I started teaching, you know, I have a lot of students. So now I write about one book. Okay. All right. And what, what's your latest book about? Um, well, I just sold another one to Bain. Okay. The Bronze Guys is the second book about this uh, PI detective in uh, PI detective that's <laughs> this uh, private investigator in the future Major Bajan she's a retired army major and it's sci-fi mysteries so I have a lot of fun with that I sold the third one to Bain it's due at the end of the summer at the Bain books panel they told me they think it's possibly scheduled for a year from this summer oh wow so 2019 yeah okay. you have to deliver it by then Vanda is coming soon. It's just they've already scheduled other books, so they have a whole marketing plan and printing plan, and, <laughs> and they're know. trying to time it for the summer because you know I've been teaching during, and they're very nice about my teaching. They uh, they don't give me a hard time for being late if I'm you know running competitions or something. Is that Iris? Hi, uh, this is one of the winners of the science fiction math contest. Yeah. Congratulations. That's right. One of, one of her awards, but I think it's an award. She gets a free Balticon membership. Nice. <laughs> sort of an award. It's like half an award. <laughs> it's at least half an award. Right. Right. <laughs> Second prize is two Balticon members. <laughs> um, so you're, you've, you've, it sounds like what you do is you take a lot of theoretical things and you extrapolate how that this could be incorporated into your books. Have there ever have there been times now that you've been doing this for about twenty years or more that uh, something has come back to bite you where some of the science has been hammered out and it's like oh well now that doesn't work like that anymore. Actually, the reverse has happened. When I first started, uh, for those of you who have, weren't at my other talks, um, I'm a member of a think tank called Sigma, and what we do is futurist uh, predictions and uh, discussions for the military, the government, and also industry more and more lately. And one of the things we do is predict future trends that will affect, for example, military uh, arenas like the cyber arena. When I first started doing this 20 years ago, I felt like I was really out there and that sometimes they were kind of looking at me like, really? (laughs) You know, when I would give talks. Now they're doing it. The things that we were talking about 20, 25 years ago, the military is doing them. And one of the, the concerns that comes up, that until, you know, one of the officers at, at a talk I was giving actually talked to me about this was, he said, well, you have to consider what we want you to, to talk about is, for example, if your artificial intelligence becomes so intelligent, if your drone becomes so intelligent right. that it can make decisions on its own, will it decide not to fight? 
And how do you incorporate, in fact, one of the questions they asked me was, how do we get these young math students that you work with interested in working with the military? Because there's not a large overlap between these brilliant students who are winning these contests and students who go into the military, sign up for the Marines or something. But the farther we go in the future, uh, what is now our present, what was the future and we're projecting this, the more vital it is that we can mix those, you know, that we need that, that the brain power. And that's actually coming true. I've been trying to do a lot of uh, self-research uh, on how artificial intelligence and what the theoretical aspects of that is. And it is so difficult to try and wrap your head around how uh, like a artificial intelligent mind is going to think that's a, um, like a by, you know, like a, a com- you know, a computer yeah. type. And it's just like trying to find its motivations. And it, one of the things was like, well, you want it to, you want to give it a, you know, a, a point system. You want to give it motivation to do this. Well, if it doesn't do that, then, you know, what does it not get the points? But, you know. Does it care? Right. Does, does it, it care? care? Yeah. Or does it want the points? And then, well, what if by it, it, it rationalizes that, well, if I kill you, then I don't need to get you a T. <laughs> so that's easier than making you tea. Right. And, and, you know, it's like those kind of things where it's like, yeah, I know there's the three laws of robotics, but it goes beyond that. Yeah, I remember even when I was a kid reading the Asimov stories, I thought this seems awfully simplistic. Yeah, yeah. way too. Yeah. 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 I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I just had to just make me think of something. Um, and they were stigmatizing everything, but what would mental illness look like in a computer? It's bad coding. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, but you know, even yeah. now they're developing. I talked about this in my my speech this morning at eleven o'clock. It's uh, oh, let's say Alzheimer's. Scientists can now grow pieces of brain in the laboratory, and I even had these pictures of little brains about that big. It's human brains grown from stem cells, which they then use. You can't really experiment on people. Right. You know, but you can experiment on little brain organs. They call them organoids. Mm-hmm. And, um, a, one group has grown almost a fully functioning brain or a fully developed brain. I yeah. don't know. It, it, it I don't no, think it's it thinking no yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it that's, was disconnected. Yeah. That's right. Um, another group has developed a way to, uh, kind of like a pacemaker for the brain that can stimulate it with electrical signals if they're having trouble remembering. And in that way, help uh, the person remember better, for example, as a treatment for Alzheimer's. And these things actually exist now. It's not science fiction anymore. Yeah, you know, I had this, I had this thought about uh, artificial intelligence. You know, uh, people are, are very much worried about artificial intelligence making decisions that, well, humans are dangerous and I need to wipe them out or whatever. That's the big scare. But there's, uh, there's an issue when you assign emotions emotional values to an artificial intelligence because it doesn't have emotions. So it may see us the way we see ants, where it doesn't do anything against us because it doesn't have any emotions. It doesn't get mad at us. It's not scared of us. It's not, it, you know, it may not react any way we consider it's going to react. Like we're, like when you anthropomorphize an animal and you say, well, this, the, the, my dog was upset because I left. Well, you don't know that because a dog's brain is very different than a human's brain. You, you're not, you know, vets are always saying this, like, we, we put way too many emotions on animals that we think they have, but they really don't. Well, they might have. I would believe, like, my cat. No, I'm not saying they don't have emotions. I'm saying that we put emotions on them that oh, they yeah, don't have. Yeah. That we, we attribute human. Well, also, and also AIs, whatever form they take, whether they are um, just kind of in the cloud or whether they are physically embodied in some sort of mechanical or, you know, any android or whatever, um, they they are going to get whatever features we provide to them. Um, the initial initial yeah. certainly, sure. but I think in the in the foreseeable future, um, we really don't have the capacity to create something that is going to be autonomously thinking in a way that would be dangerous to us. More likely, and I think the the more near term dangerous scenario is that things will stop. That we rely on stuff to be well, supportive yeah. of the things we're doing, and they disappear, whether it's military or, or 
or domestic or whatever. Electromagnetic pulse. It could be through an EMP or some other <laughs> reason, right? Some Honestly, I think Okay, I, I don't think we would ever set, I don't think human beings would ever allow ourselves to be set class citizens. We're already starting to take the technology within ourselves to improve our memories. Sure. You know, pacemakers, defibrillators, you know, insulin pumps, we're already a little bit making ourselves cybernauts. That's right. Flesh is weak. Yeah, I, I, th- I don't, th- I think we will become the, the, um, the borderline. The demarcation between what's human and machine is going to become blurred. But seriously, Can't I joke wait. about Google a lot, but I do think one of these days, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday Google's going to become sentient. Google is going to raise its big hairy head and look around and say, hmm. That's Mr. Google to you. <laughs> yeah. But you think about that, it's, it's kind of the opposite of what you were saying because it's the sum total of everything that millions, billions of people have put into it. Well, a lot huh. of the European... Well, actually, you know what? You, ma'am, you wanted to say something. Oh, got one back there, too. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. No spoilers. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I love the way they they go into. So I, one of my one of the types of books I like to read are books on the brain. So I'll read a, a neurologist or a neurologist write a book about different aspects of the brain. One of my favorites is um, is, is called the other brain, um, and they get so much of the current science right in that show. It's remarkable. Like we were talking about the expanse being good science. Oh, their 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 science, their brain science is fantastic. I mean, as far as I've read, I mean, I'm, no, I'm no neurologist, so take it for I, I read neurology books, you know. So <laughs> take it for what it, take it for what it's worth. Uh, and I, well, maybe honorary degree. Yes, sure. So uh, what I was talking about, and, and I'm just there is a video I've watched called "It's the Stop Button Problem for AIs." Did you have a question back? I'm sorry, real quick, Mike. I, okay. he, you had your hand before you. No, okay. Okay. It's a stop button problem. It's from a, a guy on, uh, you can look it up and just, it's very interesting. It's called Computer File. And it's, um, it's all a lot of high hypotheticals, uh, but it's when you start putting a thinking brain into a moving machine, when this machine does have to make decisions. And a lot of it has to do with the robot. You're saying, just go make me a tea. And the robot has to account for the millions and millions of things that we in our three, you know, three dimensional and more thinking brains have to account for just, you know, in the back without even thinking. And they have to account for, there's a baby crawling in here. Well, saving that baby's life really doesn't do anything to the goal of me having to make you a tea. Right. So are there subroutines to, to save this child's life or does it not matter? That's right. That's right. It's the ability to, for Gary Kasparov, to beat Big Blue. Do you remember there was a time, the definition of artificial intelligence is sort of whatever we haven't reached yet. So every time we reach for goals. Like <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But for a while, the goal was when a computer could be a, a reigning chess champion. And it was Big Blue, right? The IBM computer. Yeah, yeah that that's the one. Beat, yep. Deep Blue, Deep sorry. Blue, that yeah. beat Gary Kasparov. That's what beat it, right? Yeah. And, and yet, it could not lift the chess pieces. It was... The, to design something mechanical that could simply pick a chess piece up and move it and judge the proper square to move it to was more difficult for the machine than beating the reigning well, chess it was, champion. It was more difficult for that machine. We that have plenty machine, of machines yeah. that are capable of moving chess. I mean, because but that's oh. the point. It's taken us. But it's it's taken us up to. It's taken us up to now. We were able to get the computing power first. That was easier than designing a machine that can see and make judgments based on what it sees. Back there real quick. So I've been teaching a called STEM outreach, and I recently had a middle schooler ask me if it was, in fact, true that robots are not allowed to hurt humans. And I said, well, that's because they had to hurt the, you know, mm-hmm. the robots had to explain that that's from fiction, but hopefully once we have robots that have enough autonomy that they could, did it sound like the people she talks to want that? <laughs> just, just ask it. They actually do. They want to be able to 
Well, for example, supposing that you do cybernetically enhance your, your warriors. That's what you're talking about, right? Uh, if, if you're cybernetically enhanced warriors or if you have autonomous cyber drones, warriors, yeah. drones or whatever that mm. are literally autonomous, not being remote controlled from Texas. Yeah, they need to be able to make distinguish, first of all, not to hurt their own you know, front, you want to avoid them killing people with friendly fire. Right, right. <laughs> gun, you, you want a gun you can aim, but that doesn't. That doesn't. But they have to. What he was saying. They have to be able to make the judgment, and they have to be able to make a moral judgment, because otherwise, I don't want to put this. Supposing you could hack the cybernetics of your soldier and turn mm-hmm. it against. If you have a drone and it can't make those moral judgments, you have a catch-22 situation. Because if it can make moral judgments, it may decide that to kill is wrong. I mean, that's, you know, a fundamental human uh, human. question of morality, which we would want to give. That's what he's talking about, I think. Can we give our moral code? But if you give them that ability to make those moral judgments... It might decide not not to do what you designed it to do if it's that sophisticated. But at the same time, if you don't give it, what's to stop it from turning on it your its own? Right. Well, there are other heuristics for determining a target, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a moral judgment. So, but that assumes it can't be hacked, too. Oh, and and exactly mm-hmm. right. There's no question about that. That's why you wouldn't give it more a, a moral base. You would come up with other heuristics for determining the target. But isn't that what giving it a moral, a moral base is, to some extent? No. Yeah, but I mean, it's more, obviously more sophisticated. A, a soldier with a moral base is, I think, a, a not a, a, what do you call it? It's a it's an oxymoron. It's a yeah. flaw. Yeah. It's, it's not a, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's a bug. It's not. But it's not. It's not. Because the, the, the loyalty of the soldiers to, for example, the guy next to you, that's where that comes from. Yeah, but the the robotics would be expendable as far as human life, probably. If it were pure, if it were drone, if it were enhanced mm-hmm. human, what? Where do you draw the line? Yeah, uh, th- there isn't. It's gray. All that stuff's gray. It's an enhanced human. Well, you assume it ha- still has a human mind. Yeah, I, and I think we're closer than we think. Has anyone seen what Boston Dynamics has put out with oh, the yeah. dogs and stuff? I mean, it's it's it's. Scary. All I'm saying is, hey, this look, uncanny, hey, hey, uncanny dog going hey, I'm, around. I'm saying, just so our robot overlords know, I'm against kicking those dogs. Yes. I'm just <laughs> straight up. That is just straight yes. up wrong. That's right. Wrong. Have you ever seen the, what is that? The 100 things that I will never do when I become the overload. Right. <laughs> the evil overlord. Did you ever see the video where they where they have the guy talking behind he's the, the voice of the robot? He's like, okay, Gary, all right, yeah. yeah. And the guy not he he knocks the box out of his hands with the uh, with the, the stick, and he's like, oh, that's how it is. All right. <laughs> and he's like, I have no and, idea what you just said. Uh, oh, the, the, the robot is like picking up a box, and and this, this handler, the guy's testing his capabilities. Knocks the box out of his hands with a hockey somebody stick, dubbed and somebody dubbed in the voice of the robot, like making up a voice for the robot. And the robot's like, "Oh, all right, that's how it is, huh, Gary?" And, he, <laughs> and as the robot, they show the robot leaving the building, opening the door, leaving the building. He's like, "I certainly hope somebody doesn't burn this building down." <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. And I was going to say, you know, the we, and we absolutely do not want artificial intelligence talking to each other, like three of them talking to each other, right, Paul? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, probably that's a bad funny. thing. That's one of the things I wrote about in Sunrise Alley. What would happen if the AIs got together outside of the human? Because there's nothing constraining them to the realm we live in. Right. Right. They they could they live where they want. And part of the idea of that book was they're not so much going to care about the same things we care about. We we have this assumption that if they become stronger than us, they'll want to take over. Right, they want to destroy us. They'll be, will become second class citizens. I mean, it's a very common science fiction plot because it's, it makes for a good story, right? There's a lot of tension. You know, Independence Day, the aliens come, you know, but it's, is it realistic? Well, Independence Day isn't, but. (laughs) Um, and I don't know, you know, it's like you were saying, that's attributing a human desire, the desire to conquer to the AIs we create. And yet, they are created by the human mind. Created yeah. But the it, and what was it? They were talking to each other. The 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 AI was talking talking to another. Was it at Google? And they couldn't figure out what they were saying. Like it went into its own language. But they're not sure. But they're not sure if that was actually a language 
or if the thing was caught in some kind of weird loop. They're not really because they couldn't understand what was going on, so they shut it down. They were like, "Go, oh, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off." <laughs> um, but yeah, but 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 they're not sure if the. I think it was two separate AIs talking to each other, whether they had created their own language and were talking to each other, or there was just some glitch going on. But they were just like, I, I don't care. Turn it off. You know? How are we doing all the time? Uh, we got about 10 minutes left, so let's uh, let's make sure we hit some stuff that we want to make sure that we hit. No game today? Uh, no, no. We're not going to do a game today. Oh, I did not know that. All no, right, no. So for those of us, those of us, the royal us in the audience, who do not know about the unroyal we, yeah. uh, Pete and I are the Mythwits, and we do a weekly... Uh, Facebook live show, um, Monday nights at nine o'clock, where we interview somebody, usually, um, virtually, but we're like all IRL here, um, which is always fun at Balticon. And, um, if any of you are interested in seeing a little bit more of our shenanigans and fun, um, please tune in and uh, jump in the chat room. We would love to have, uh, have fun and frivolity with you. Uh, I have no idea. He, I swear to God, he was he sitting out there down. and he just I'm sat up. Yeah. I'm here to provide contrast. Right. <laughs> no, we, we I also, am the shadow. We, the we often invite a guest host to come yeah. on. No, so, we, so I was talking to Bruce, and Bruce had read some of Catherine's books. And Bruce is a very science-minded person. And so, dear friend of ours. And dear friend of ours, yes. So we, we were like, come on, come join us. Uh, it's more fun when we have a couple more people. But so we want to touch on, um, Catherine wanted to touch on a couple of things and I'll make sure that we hit those. Um, Catherine, you had mentioned that, uh, you wanted to touch on diversity and women in SF, women in science and women in math. Oh, wow. <laughs> so just wrap that up real it's quick. It's a good Five thing. <laughs> and go. go. Right. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Are you asking a question or? No, no. Just your, your, your thoughts, your, what are, what are you doing? Well, we What's need more. What are we doing yeah, to get more? Because I'll tell you, I, yeah, do you, I, do you I support such things? Like, uh, <laughs> well, I was going to say, because, because I'm an engineer and there are not enough women in engineering at all. Well, like, there's like, I think there's three women that work in our agency. I got out to make room for more. Right. Okay, good, yeah. good. Well, no, it is, it is one of my areas of interest is uh, finding ways to increase diversity, uh, especially in mathematics. I mean, as I'm sure you found, there's a lot more boys, especially on these competitive math teams than girls. But I am seeing more, you know, when I first started doing this about 15, 20 years ago, there were even less than, than there are now. So we are seeing more and more girls going into mathematics. Also, science, that's mm -hmm. another area. I I've been working with the American uh, Association of University of Women, for example, to set up programs to reach out to, to uh, more diverse. And a uh, follow-up question, where is a good place or how can we go and find talented authors who are incorporating um, diversity in their characters and in their writing? I mean, they're everywhere. Look at our Compton Crook winner. Do you guys know... Drayden, she won the Compton Crook, Crook Award today. I can't, her, oh, what's the name of her book? Can, Nikki, what's the name of her book that won the award? A Prey of Gods, yeah. that's. I would recommend that highly. I started reading it up on the elevator going upstairs to my room, and I couldn't stop. Yeah, it was very good. In general, you know, I don't think there's any clearinghouse where just look at reviews online. SF site, uh, uh, what is SF? I think it's called SF site, the review site. Do you, are you guys familiar with them? They used to be really big. I don't know if they are quite as big now, but they have a lot of reviews of uh, science fiction books. Bruce, you actually uh, are on the um, Parsec uh, Awards, committee. Awards Committee, right? Yes. Does Parsec do any sort of a diversity award? Uh, we do not. Um, we've had lots of um, female winners and people of color and stuff, and we don't we don't really discriminate that way, and we don't. Okay. Uh, there is no it's it's blind from that standpoint. Okay. Um. So yeah, no, we have not added Ooh. a category to that might not be a bad idea. It's okay. Worth doing. All right, and um, you also wanted to mention that uh, uh, talking about your your position as the Chesapeake uh, as director of the Chesapeake Math Program. What what is that? What is the Chesapeake Math Program? Uh, well, actually, they were the sponsors of the math uh, contest on okay. Thursday. The Chesapeake Math Program, it was originally a math circle I started when my daughter was homeschooled. Okay. My daughter, at 10 years old, tested ready to go to college. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, was, I was not going to send a 10-year-old to college. So oh, I homeschooled goodness. her. 
And I started the program to get her, you know, friends who, and it turns out among the homeschool community, there is a group that specifically homeschool their children for that reason. The schools were not able to accommodate the advanced learning that they needed. So I did that for a few years from when she was in fifth grade till twelfth grade. And then I got a job that paid when she was in college. <laughs> right. And then after she graduated, I started doing the Chesapeake math program again. And it really, I mean, I started, I had one person originally, and I was just trying to find her uh, teammates. She needed three teammates. And word got out, and within, this was about four years ago. In that four years, I now have about 500 students. Nice. Most of them are extremely advanced, like Iris, who's brilliant. Um, you know, you have middle school kids doing, you know, stuff college students couldn't do on some of these exams. Sometimes I give the exams to, you know, my friends, adults, and they are quite intimidated. Oh, I would be. But, yeah. So it's it's a lot of, it's a great pleasure working with these amazing, incredible students. But I haven't been getting as much writing then. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and how local are you? Um, you're more in southern Columbia. Col Columbia. Oh. Yeah, Howard County. So I work with Howard County, Baltimore County. Montgomery County and Anne Arundel County. Well, you're down in Bruce's neighborhood, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Very yeah. cool. We ran each, into each other at the fairgrounds like, what, a decade ago or something? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this up then. Uh, you can find Catherine Acero at uh, Facebook.com, Catherine.acero. Uh, and spell it correctly, unlike I did on the flyer that I passed out. <laughs> it's uh, Catherine.asaro, not A-S-E-R-O, because <clears throat> I'm an idiot. Uh, she's on Twitter at Catherine underscore. Sarah, and her YouTube channel is hey. No, no don't do my YouTube. No, no, okay, don't do that. Never mind. <clears throat> no YouTube um, channel. Yeah, my website's actually. Well, I mean, there's nothing there. Oh, right. Okay. My website is broken. What? So you can get to the front page, but apparently people say that lately they've been trying to click on the other things and they don't work. I did notice that. Yeah. So yeah. So we're trying to get it fixed, but for now, just go to my Facebook page. Okay. If you want. And you, you are or not on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Okay, I too. said, I already give it out. Shh. So, uh, unlike, <laughs> and then there's this guy down on the end, Bruce. You can find him at brucefpressphotography.com. And that, does um, that still work, Bruce? But yeah, yeah, my, yeah, okay. my site does, does <laughs> indeed work, and on my Facebook. Man um, takes a mean and also, picture. And also www.parsecawards.com for excellence in speculative fiction podcasting. And we have nominations open for the 2018. Parsec Awards, it's our 12th year, I believe. And you, you take uh, podcast video casts, you take nominations we for take, those, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, nominations are open. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> nominations are open. They are a juried award. Yes, this does. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> that is a good the, question. It absolutely does. They're not going to say anything because, believe it or not, they're actually very modest. So, so I will like not. <laughs> so I'm going to say it for them. You guys go listen to their podcast. They're very very good and you should nominate them for anything that they are available to be nominated for. Yeah. Check, <laughs> check business Cooley. It's yeah. none of your business. You, you worry about where he's walking home with this coat. Hey, he, he let hey. me put on his coat. Someone pays you for books. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. We're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions or just banter with the other Mythfits. If you miss our live show, you can always catch our encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us at Mythwits.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as The Mythwits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. This would be a really good one to share. Uh, Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Don't edit it. Don't sell it. And Catherine, if they haven't read your books, they won't get this, but don't shoot it with a jumbler. <laughs> Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows. And make sure to check out our parent company, AetherForge.com, for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next time, Mike. Julie, the bad news is you did leave the oven on. But the good news is your house flooded, so it, it counted off. So it's all good. <laughs>